Once again, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar where we'll be discussing about how you can invite family to the UK. Our able, distinguished speaker, like I like to call him, Toy Badilodi, is going to be, you know, taking us through the most important aspects of, you know, living in the UK, um, being able to invite people as well. So I'll just give it a bit of some time. I can still see more people. I can see Pauline. I can see Pauline is from Nigeria. Amazing. Let's just wait for more people to join and then we'll continue. Thank you. Not like you know, it's not really a game, but I would like to know how long you've been in the UK in the comments, in the chat rather. You can just type how long have you been in the UK? When did you arrive? How's it been so far? But basically, how many years, months, weeks have you spent in the UK? So let's see. I feel like everybody that joined here today is ready to invite family. So let's know how long you about 15 years. So if, no, so if is our boss, I beg. <laughs> so if is our boss. About 15. Let's see if anybody can beat Toib to 15 years. Is there is anybody here that's been in the UK for 16 years? 17 years. Toib must not win this, please, please. Someone else has to beat him to it. Idia, how long have you been in the UK? One year, 13 days. Oh my God, Jeremiah, that's so specific. I love that. He said one year, 13 days. Elvis says 11 days. Wow, welcome, Elvis. A round of applause. You're welcome to the UK. I like you're coming at it at the best time. So you get used to the weather on time. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Idia, um, Toyib is our elder. Ah. Uh, Wow, wow, Gwenga has been here since 1991. Am I correct? Or does he mean like 91 days? Wow, 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 wow. How many, how many years is since 1991? Let's see whether you, somebody has beaten to him. Thank you, Olu. Thanks for tuning in all the way from Eastbourne, UK. Nice to have you here. Wale says one year, eight months. Amazing, amazing, amazing um wow 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 that's so good that's so good that's so good hi prince all the way from accra ghana thank you akwaba thank you for and i hope i'm using the word right <laughs> thank you for tuning in that's amazing do you plan to come to the uk very soon prince <laughs> thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you Oh, you're planning a visit this Christmas. Amazing. So you're here to learn. So you can tell your loved ones how to apply. We love it. We love, we love the the um th the thinking ahead, the future thinking. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in. Hi, Sally Sue from Oxford. Nice to have you here. Are you guys planning to invite somebody? Let us know in the comments. Are you, are you planning to invite your mom, your brother, your spouse, your sibling? Let us know. Let us know. Let us know. Let's get to know. We will be starting very, very soon. Please just bear with us. We're just trying to wait for the numbers to increase. Okay, yeah. Jeremiah is expecting a relative. He's tuned in to learn. Oh, I saw girlfriend K. Oh, interesting. I love it. I love matters of the heart. I pray that it all works out and everybody's visa comes true. Um, Wale is planning to invite his mom. That's amazing. Oh, that's amazing. Adam is tuned in from Nigeria. Where in Nigeria are you tuned in from? Let's get to know whether you used to be our former neighbor. Let's reconnect with you. Calabar, that's amazing. That's amazing. Are you plan? Is somebody planning to invite you to the UK? Oh damn, let's know, please. Oh, oh, Sally Sue is planning to invite his mom, but he doesn't know what the process and uh, amazing. That's why we are here today, so that you can get to know what the process is really about. Thank you all for engaging in the comments. Wonderful energy. I I really really appreciate it. Um, I will be moving on with my presentation right now. 
please bear with me um, in a moment. I will be presenting. Yes, um, first things first, um, I'll just talk about the topic. Like we all know, you're welcome to our usual monthly webinars with Toib. Toib is a maestro and we love having him here to speak to us about all matters concerning the UK. If you're new, if you're thinking of moving, if you have family here and you know you want to know more about how they can cope here as well, you can tune in, learn a thing or two, a thing or two share with them as well. And if you're also planning to come to the UK anytime soon, it's always a good idea to join our webinars as well. Um, so we'll be talking about how you can invite your family to the UK, the visa and immigration guide. We've had people, you know, just ask us, oh, what would it take with my visa? Am I allowed to invite somebody? Some people also want to know that as students, do they have to wait until it's their graduation before they can invite somebody? Um, those people who are probably on care um, visa, they want to know what the requirements are as well. People on tier two, you know, things like that. So we are here to answer all your questions today and you are in the right place and you're in good hands as well. Um, yeah. I will now move on to... <clears throat> Lemfi. So I see that a good number of us already live in the UK, and that's honestly amazing. Um, and I already assume that this is not your first time of hearing about our products, Lemfi, but for the sake of people in Nigeria, people who are planning to come as well, or those who are in the UK who don't really know about the products, I'll just go ahead and introduce what Lemfi is about to you. Lemfi was founded in 2020. And with one goal, which is to simplify um, money transfers to Africa. And what we essentially do, what we exist for is to ensure that Africans living in diaspora do not have issues sending money home. We want to ensure that that connection is not broken. Um, you don't need to worry about, oh, um, how do I you know, keep in touch with family and friends and ensure that their needs are being met, their financial needs are being met also for people like you know people who have projects back home investments back home and they're already worried about how do i send money regularly we've been created lemfi to ensure that that is now a problem of the past you don't need to worry about that anymore um so we get this question a lot where can i use lemfi can i use lemfi in australia can i use lemfi in japan well you can only use, as of today, you can only use LEMFI in the UK, the US, and Canada. LEMFI is operational in the diaspora, meaning that if you download LEMFI in Nigeria, you can use it in Nigeria. You can only use LEMFI with a UK, US, or Canada um, phone number, as well as um, location, in quotes. Um yeah, what countries do we support? As much as I said that we don't, you can't use um, Lenfai in Africa, you can use Lenfai in the diaspora to send money to Africa. So what African countries do we support? We support about 10 African countries, Nigeria, Ghana, Rwanda, Tanzania, Cameroon, Ivory Coast, and so on, Kenya, and so on. You can send money to these countries easily with Lenfai. Yeah, like I said, um, Africans in the UK, the US, and Canada can send money home at the best rate securely, instantly, and at zero transaction fees. So with other apps, you have hidden, hidden charges or you have charges you pay when you send money. That does not exist on LEMFI. People ask me this a lot. Is it free? Are you sure it's free? Are you sure they won't still take my money? I can assure you it is a hundred percent free. You don't have to worry about hidden charges. Your money is secure and you can send money. It's the best and the easiest way to send money from the diaspora to Africa. Where can you access Lemfi? Where can you get Lemfi? Lemfi is available on Google Play Store as well as the App Store. So if you want to start sending money, 
to um to your loved ones in Africa at zero transaction fees for free and as easy as possible. You can go on to your Google Play Store or your App Store today, search LEMFI LEMFI, and then you would be able to download it as well and then move on. So um who is speaking to us today? Like you all know, Toy Badelodun is speaking us speaking to us today. He's a personal development coach. He's a project engineer and planner, and he's been based in the UK with over a decade of industry experience. He continues to provide guidance to hundreds of individuals looking to pursue opportunities abroad. I always say this, that so many influencers, they kind of instill fear in you when you want to move to the UK. But one of the reasons why we love Toib and we connect with him so much is because he always sees possibilities. And honestly, when you're looking for a better life, you're trying to start life afresh or you're, you know, trying to better the quality of your life, all you need is that positive energy. And we love that Toib always brings the positive energy whenever he's here to speak. And as well, you can also connect with Toib on his Twitter page, um, T-A-A-D-E-L-O-D-U-N. -A 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 so if you have any questions that doesn't get answered today, you can tweet at Toib. He is really very open to answering questions anytime and he would engage you. Yes, so um, we have a referral program on LEMFI where you can earn money, yes. If you can this is a passive income for you so what you need to do is um you you sign up on lengthy when you sign up on lengthy you get a referral code and you share a referral code with um your friends when they um send money you earn 10 pounds so we currently have another um, referral challenge going on for nigerians uh if you can send if you can send your referral code to your five friends and they sign up on LEMFI using your referral code and they send more than 100 pounds to Nigeria this month, or oh, September is almost over, but it also extends to October. If they send more than 100 pounds back home in October, you get a total of 850 pounds at the end of the month. And this is something you should take advantage of. Just five friends will give you 150 pounds. So please don't even like, don't, don't sleep on it, please. Start sharing your referral code. Start getting people to use, your friends to use it as well. You can use the referral for, for today when you're signing up. To get 10 pounds cash back, you can use the referral code webinar and then you will get a 10 pound cash back on your first transaction above 100 pounds. So please download, start sending money, start earning money on LEMFI. Thank you so much. Um, that is the end of my presentation. I am glad that I was able to, you know, come on here and speak to you guys today and connect with you. If you have any um, questions before we start presenting, you can still send your questions through to the Q&A box. Um, yeah, I see some people have already dropped questions. Yes, the recording will be shared and any other question you have will be answered. Any other questions you have concerning inviting family would be answered by Toib shortly. So I will hand over the mic to Toib as well. Please bear with me. Hi, Toib. I have made you host now, so I'm sure you can go ahead and share your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Can you? Can everyone see me now? Yeah, I can see you live and thank direct. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Gospel, for that uh, introduction, uh, telling us about what uh, LEMFI does. Thank you to everyone that joined in. And I want to just say a special thank you to everyone that has joined us this evening as we share information, share experience. I think the, the end goal is for us to be able to, to achieve what we want. Um, and it's always good when we congregate like this and share our stories, we share each other's experiences, and we are able to make progress. That is the end goal, all of us making progress in whatever we want to do. Um, this 
visit visa thing can be quite expensive, can have a lot of challenges, but if we can demystify it now and each of us are able to achieve success when we make this application, that, that is a huge benefit. And this is why we must thank LEMFI for always doing this, supporting the community. Um, I've been to several, you know, um, several events that have been organized and you just see the spirit of wanting us to grow because when we grow, we can touch more lives at home. You know, this is school fees period now. A lot of us that are here, we've been able to chip in one or two pounds to people at home and LEMFA is giving us that, that opportunity to do that. And they are also supporting us. I mean, different seminars we've held about how to get into construction, how to do teacher training, how to do, how to come in as a teacher, how to get skilled worker visa. Everything is on uh, LEMFI's uh, YouTube channel. So please go there, check the videos, watch them. They are as detailed as possible. The slides are there. So it's, it's, it's just amazing, amazing, the amount of information we can share together and grow. So I will jump into the slides quickly. Um, and I'll run through it as quickly as possible so we can have a bit of time to go through the Q&A. Um, thank you so much, Gospel, for that uh, introduction and the, and the presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. I'll just um, share the slide now and then we can, we can make a start. Okay, let's see. Share screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can, yeah. Right, okay. Thank you so much everybody once again. Um, let's make a start. That's just the introduction slide. Okay, um, a bit of introduction. Uh, my name is Toyi Badewale Adelodon, as uh, Gusko said earlier, I mean, some of our people have always joined. I think I can see the Prince there. He's always a part of uh, a lot of our seminars. Thank you for always joining. Thank you those that are joining for the first time. And thank you to everyone that is coming back to join us again. So I was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria. I've been living in UK, as I said before, about 15 years now. And um, I've been privileged to work closely with a lot of people making visa applications. I started uh, visa journeys application myself around 2003. That's about 20 years now. Um, and I've been doing several applications by myself that didn't work before I eventually came. And one thing that happened to me at a point in my journey was that there was um, some people are just going about on motorbikes. Sorry. Okay, they've gone. So around the period, very early during that time, there was, a, there was a lawyer that stays beside my house. And what he specializes on is immigration. So I used to go to his office. I just sit down there and help him out with bits and pieces. So when a rights appeal, when people get denied visa, I just get that back kind of experience of reading through what people have done, what they've done wrong. So a lot of the things that I share come from the experience I have doing it myself and experience I have shadowing people that have done it, and experience I have with people that do like um, the legal part of it uh, when the lawyers write appeal. So that is everything that I pour into what I do online, what I share with people. It's just a combination of all these uh, experience. And when our people come on board as well, when they ask their questions, we see that there are different stories, you know, and then we are able to learn from each other and then use that to, to better ourselves. So I'll be sharing my personal experience on the way and some of the things that I've learned with people I worked with. My parents also visited uh, earlier this year and it inspired some people to also take that step. There was one of our sisters that is also a student here. She's here with her husband, you know, the husband is a dependent and they also invited um, her parents and her parents came and then she sent me one wonderful message that, wow, because you shared yours, I'm able to do mine as well. And, and she was really, really happy. And there are a couple of other people as well that have just taken those steps. So what we are going to do tonight, is give us that bit of introduction, how to do it, you know, what the government requires, what we can do to better our chances so that, you know, we, we can have a high, high, very high chance of getting, 
of getting that visa. Uh, so let's do it. Um, that's a picture of my parents um, at Heathrow when I went to meet them. And then uh, we were talking about some other places that you can go when you have that UK visit visa. Once that UK visit visa is given to you and you've come to UK once, there are some other places that you can go with that visa that you don't even need to apply for anything again. Just do hotel reservation, buy a ticket and go to those countries. One of those places is Gibraltar. I'll give you a small list later on. So my mom was complaining that ah, UK is cold, UK is cold. I said, okay. So I got the tickets. I said, let's go to Gibraltar for a few days. And Gibraltar is south of Spain. It's hot almost all through the year. I mean, I went there December 27 last year and it was smoking hot. I couldn't believe how hot it was. So that was us um, in Gibraltar. I just took them for a few days to, to have a good time. And this was a message I was telling you about from, um, from that sister that sent, um, that brought her parents here as well to visit. My parents are here. I always wanted to do this. You know, the post about my parents, like reinforced our commitment to do it. it, was a bit expensive, but she feels so fulfilled to be able to give her parents, you know, those that taste of, I mean, traveling to the UK. When my parents came, it was their first time of being on a flight. That was when they came here the first time. And I was the first person to travel in our immediate family as well. No one has ever been on a plane before me. So it was it's a very, very good feeling to reconnect with your family, especially when you, you know, there are some important things like graduation, when you have a baby, you know, and then some people, they may be students, maybe they are not able to do dependent visa yet, and they just want to in, um, invite like uh, their boyfriend or their girlfriend that they've been together for a while, being able to do that, it's, it's a very, very good thing. And we'll run through, run through everything um, this evening. Okay, so I'll touch on those countries that you can visit, you know, after you get the visa, you know, just buy your ticket, book hotel reservation. You can do small insurance as well. You can always get insurance on website like Go Compare, you can compare the market, just get insurance. The insurance, most times it's about 10 pounds and it will cover you for all the basic things you need for the trip. And then hotel reservation, return ticket, and then you can go to these countries once you have your UK visit visa and you've used it once into the UK. Like my parents one, they came here and then we went from here to Gibraltar. They came back here and then after some weeks, they went back to Nigeria. But you have to use it once into the UK so that that stamp is there. And then from then on, you can probably fly from Nigeria to the place as long as you've used it once to come to the UK. Or you can fly from UK to there and then from there back home, depending on how you want it. So Gibraltar, Albania, Montenegro, Sebra, Serbia, they are very, very beautiful places to spend time. And I think one thing that can happen as well is that once they have that visa, like your parents, they have that visa and they are here, you know, when you have time off work, you can do your tour around the UK if you want, or you can go to some very nice places outside the UK, like Gibraltar, you know, south of... With Gibraltar, you can see, like, just a small gate, and you are inside Spain already. That's how, how close to Spain you are. And then Albania, very, very beautiful. I've been to Albania before. That is a very, very beautiful place to go as well. So all you need is just hotel reservation, return ticket, and then... Um, some small travel insurance and you you are flying. Okay, so who can invite someone? Basically, inviting someone means like you have an element of resident permit on your visa. So if you are here on a visitor's visa, you can't invite someone because you are here as a visitor as well. But when you come here as a student, you see that you are giving a resident permit, you know, and that shows that you are living here. You know, even when you are doing any other thing, they will say you are resident in the UK for tax purposes. So during that time that you are living here, you can invite someone to come and visit you. That can be, as we said earlier, your family, your friends, people that are close acquaintance, you can, you can invite them. Maybe you normally do, um, Let's say you have a, a meeting that you normally do every year or maybe like a hiking uh, session that you do with your friends every year. And now you are here in the UK and your friends say, okay, let's come and do those things, mountaining or whatever it is. Just come and do it in the UK this time since you are there. And they are able to fund it, you know, 
you could invite them. If it's family, parents, brother, sister, you can always, you can do that as well, as long as your visa has that resident permit element. So if you've got a work permit as well, you've got a resident permit. So if say you are on the health care visa, you're in a skilled worker visa, all those kind of visas that give you that element of a resident permit, you should definitely be able to, to invite um, family and friends. So that should, um, that should answer that question. And then we'll move on to how to apply. So I would say application for the UK visit visa is actually very, very simple. If you look, one thing about UK immigration is that if you know where to look on UK government website, which is that gov.uk website, it has virtually everything you need. You see everything there clearly, clearly stated. If there are no complications, you don't really need a consultant to do a UK visa because more often than not, step by step, everything you need is always on their website. Moving on to the second point, it is the burden of proof, you know, that lies with the applicant that makes it very, very difficult. Because if you are coming to visit the UK, the impression is that, you know, they know what is going on in our country economically. They know that the Naira is down, the Naira is about, I think, one pound is about a thousand, over a thousand Naira now, you know, a thousand, up to a thousand two hundred. And they know what the economic condition is saying, say unemployment and all of that. So when they see someone saying, I want to go and visit the UK, you have to really, really prove to the entry clearance officer that your intentions are genuine. It's not something that, um, that makes me happy or that make any of us happy. That why am I like guilty until I have to prove myself innocent? But unfortunately, because of where we come from in Africa, and the economic challenges we have, we always have this problem when we are applying for visa. Let me give you an example. Someone was, uh, a reporter was making an allegation um, on, I think it was on Twitter recently. He said they went for an event in Sweden, you know, and that event is a massive event. He said all other people in all other countries that they gave visa, they gave them like three months visa. For the people that were going from Nigeria, they only give them like, less than a week, you know, say, just go to the event and come back. And you now wonder, why is that the case? You know, why are we not, you know, accorded the same respect and thing that they give every other, every other country in the world? You know, they now give us a couple of days visa. And I've seen those kind of things come up several times. Maybe someone is going for a conference and then they just give, I think it's very, very common with the Schengen people. They just give you a few days, you know, just go and come back. And the reason, part of the reason you can get the understanding is that from the economic point of view, they have this view that hmm, we are not very, very wealthy people. Maybe we don't have money to spend in their economy. Maybe we are going to run away if they give us the visa. And they just have this thing that, that forms the way the, um, their immigration rules are. But I'll be very, very clear with the UK, I haven't seen anyone that has been given a visa short of the six months when you apply for a visit. And then when you renew, you can renew for two years. Those are what I've been saying. I haven't seen the cases where they give you less than six months. I haven't seen that. I must be, I must be fair when I'm talking about the UK. But in the Schengen area, I've seen people that have been given seven days, two weeks, as they deem fit, but the UK is slightly very, very different. I haven't seen, I'm not sure if there's anyone else out there. I've, what I've seen is that they'll give you six months and then you can renew for two years and then you, you get five years and then you get 10 years. That's how it has been since I have been into this um, immigration thing. So they know the economic situation. That is why you have to prove to them that burden of proof lies with us. And I always say, anything you say, make sure you have a document to back it up. And one thing I've done with this presentation is that I have included some refusal letters so that we can review it together and have an understanding of how the immigration officer thinks. Because for them, it is black and white. You cannot have like a maybe, maybe not, that kind of idea. That person, that consular entry consular officer has to be sure, you know, 
they're close to, let's say like 95% sure that hmm, this person is going and is coming back. That is how they treat each application. So I want us to follow this uh, presentation and then catch up on the recording, check all the web links that are in there. There is a lot of information there that will help. Okay, so applying for this uh, visit visa, it has two steps. The first step is the one that you do on the gov.uk website itself, where you will register your email, fill the form, fill the application form, and that is part of uh, step one, stage one, as I put it on the slide. So stage one, you sign up, and the link to sign up is there. You fill the form. You can pause the form and come back and continue, okay? You can always do that. There's no problems with that. Once you sign in, once you have your password, you can do the application bit by bit. You fill the form online and then that is stage one. Stage two is when you go to the visa application center and go and do your biometrics. I always say every document that you upload, because in stage one, you can upload your documents as well. You can upload scanned copy of your documents. In fact, I would say take your time and scan those documents very, very well, because that is that is a very intensive one, particularly for someone that um, that has a lot of documents. When I was doing mine, I scanned my uh, my passport, scanned my uh, all the bills, my council tax, my uh, my Wi-Fi bills, my energy bills. I scanned all of them one by one. And the good thing with UK abuse is that some of them come in PDF already. So it was just a case of just uploading them. But the ones that are not in PDF, I had to scan them and have them on my memory stick and I uploaded them all at once. So that scanning of that document has to be done. Some people do it when they go to the visa application center. You have that, um, I think they have that, uh, that service where they can help you to to upload your documents as well. So whichever one you choose, know that you have to upload as much documents as possible based on the application you are making. So step two is when you go to the um, TLS Visa Application Center and then you, you do your biometrics and then you, you book an appointment on that website. That website is there that you can do it. You book an appointment there and then you can, uh, you can go for your biometrics and do every other thing. You can also pay for an express service when you are the, um, at the TLS center. There are so many things that they do and you see everything there on the website. So once you go to this website, you'll be able to pick the country that you want to submit your application. If it's Ghana, maybe it's from Nigeria, wherever it is, you put it there and then it'll take you to a link to the office and then you feel everything that you have to do. So the visa application fee for six months presently is 100 pounds. And if you are doing two years, most times what I know is that you have to apply for six months first. You can't apply for two years straight away. Um, I wouldn't say you should hold me on that, but that is what I've always seen. You do six months first, and then after that you apply for, for two years. Because even you are not allowed to stay longer than six months at one visit anyways. So if you are coming for the first time, technically you have to apply for, for six months first. So you pay this fee when you are at stage one, when you are doing the application in stage one, you pay the fee then. And then you can also scan and upload your documents. It is advisable to take the originals with you when you go to the visa application center. I told my parents, take everything and just go there with you, uh, with, with them. So the visa application center, has several services that you can pick from. As I said earlier, when you go for your biometrics, they do like a, a bit of fast track where you don't have to queue for too long. They do different things there. When you go on, your web, on their website, you see. And then they also have a video illustration um, there that you can click and watch the whole process itself and then see how it works at the uh, visa application center. The process time of your visa is around three weeks. Sometimes, they may have some slight delays sometimes, but more often than not, around three weeks, you should hear the decision of your, um, of your application. Let me just drop one tip here. This thing that is what I've seen a lot. If they send you a letter, if they send you a PDF letter 
about your application, more often than not, it means it has been refused. But if you get something from TLS to say your travel document is ready, more often than not, it means that you are going to collect your visa. This is what this is. A, this is a pattern that I've seen. Don't quote me on it, but this is what I've seen. If they send you a letter from uh, the gov UK dot so 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 so, highly likely that visa has been refused. But if they send you, if it's TLS that tells you that your 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 travel document is ready, then you know um, it is very likely the visa is there. That's just something that I've observed. Don't quote me on it, as I said. Okay, so these are the requirements that are on the gov.uk website itself. You know, um, you must have a passport or a travel document to enter the UK, and that passport must be valid for the period of your stay. So if you're applying for a six-month visa, so your passport must at least exceed six months, the validity, the present validity. So let's say you're applying in January, your passport must expire, let's say, much more beyond June if you get what I mean. So your passport must not expire whilst you are still in the UK, that kind of thing. So your passport must be valid for the whole of your stay in the UK. And you must be able to show that you leave UK at the end of your visit. How are you able to show that? We'll talk through that in a bit. You are able to support yourself and your dependents during your trip. So if you are a family person, let's say you have a wife, you have kids, and you are the only one coming to the UK, you must show that your dependents back home, they are going to do well. There's no issues. You've sorted them financially before coming to the UK. You know, that's that's the kind of thing that you and your dependents are able to support themselves during your trip or have funding from someone else to support you. So how are you sometimes, like my parents, when my parents came, they don't work, you know. So I had to show that I had the money to, to support them. So that is one element. We'll get to that when we are talking about funding as well. And you are able to pay for your return and onward journey. You know, your tickets, who is going to pay for it? Those are the kind of things you have to prove. And you will not live in the UK for extended periods through fr uh, frequent or successive visits, or you make UK your main home. We must not forget this visa is a visitor's visa. It's not a visa that says you are coming to live in the UK. So don't come and just drag it unnecessarily. You don't want them to have that feeling that you're actually using the visit visa as a, as a guise to live in the UK. So come, stay for a couple of weeks, go back home. You can always come back, stay for a couple of weeks because they'll give you a multiple entry visa. So you come and go, you can come and go. As long as you are going to family, nobody worries you. But when they have a feeling that it looks like, ah, this person is using these visas as opportunity. Let's say you have like, five-year visa now, and you are spending more time in the UK, you know, and you already told them that you are working, you know, you are giving them that, okay, you are spending this much time in the UK, when are you doing your actual work that you said you are doing? So you don't want to give them that expression. That's what that clause there is all about. Okay, so the documents that you need for a visit visa, a visit visa is not like a student visa. That is a point-based system where they say uh, CAS from school is so, so, so point. Proof of fund is so, so, so point. The visit visa is very, very different. The visit visa, you cannot put enough documents and you cannot put too much documents. As long as those documents are supporting what you are trying to say and they are genuine and original, please put them in because you want everything that will convince the entry clearance officer that look, I'm just going to the UK on holiday, I'm not going there to live there. So I am putting these documents in to prove to you that, you know, I'm just going there on a visit. So put in as much documents as you can. So make sure your documents are prepared, ready. Any statement you make in the application must be backed with supporting documents. As I said before, they know the economic situation of African countries, and they have this feeling that a lot of people are just trying to leave, and they are trying to leave by whichever reasons. So. If you are genuinely coming to visit your family, you have to show them as much as possible that, look, I'm just coming to visit to have a good time with my family. I am definitely coming back. So if you are visiting family, there are two ways, there are different ways to visit. You can visit in the sense that you are just a tourist and you have a job, 
you are just a tourist, you just want to come and sightsee the UK, you just want to come and view the UK. In that case, you are not visiting family. So what you would do in that case, because we are actually talking about visiting family, so I'm just dropping this here for the benefit of anyone. So if you are coming to visit the UK without actually visiting family, so these are the things that you, you are supposed to do. You must show your own sustenance, how you are surviving wherever you are, say Ghana, Nigeria, what job you are doing, provide details of the job. If you are a contractor, provide details of the contract you are getting. If you are a salary person, provide your letter of employment, if you can still have it, provide the letter from your employer to show that you are an employer, you are an employee, this is your salary, this is how much you get every month. You also show your living expenses as well. You can show that, okay, my rent, this is how much I pay, show your, your rent receipts, show your, your tax documents, because UK is a country of a lot of documentation in terms of tax uh, and all of that. So it would be good that you are already a taxpayer and you are paying your tax well and you have your tax receipts. Show all of those things. So you are going to the UK and you don't have family. What are you supposed to do? You can book a hotel. You know, you can book a hotel in London to say, you'll be in London. What would you be doing in London? You'll be visiting. There's Big Ben, you can visit the Big Ben. You could visit the Tower of London. You could visit uh, Madame Tussauds. You could be going to watch uh, Arsenal play Tottenham. You know, you buy the ticket for the game online. You book a hotel. You know, those kind of things are the things that a tourist will normally do. If I'm going to Europe now, nobody asks me, hey, 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 what's going on? What are you going to do? Because they know that ah, I'm working here. You know, I don't live in Europe. I'm just going to Europe to spend a weekend. And those are the kind of things you can do if you are not visiting family. What other places can you visit in UK? Go on Google, you will see a lot of um, tourist attraction. Just type top 20 tourist attractions in London, if it is London that you are going. If you are going to Scotland, type top 20 tourist attractions in Scotland. There are places where you can buy the tickets to go to those tourist attractions. Buy all of them, you know, book a hotel close to the place, you know, those are the kind of things that will give them an impression that this person is actually going to where he said he's going. Because you cannot be saying you are you bought tourist attraction in Lagos and your your hotel is in Quara. They will think, ah, that doesn't make any sense. You know, so use Google Map to check out all, all those kind of things, get those documents together, and then you can now say, I am just going on holiday. And then they can ask a couple of questions and say, okay, the country that you are in the continent that you are in, you've not been going on holiday there before. Why are you going to London now? Those are the kind of questions a, an entry clearance officer can ask. So you must be prepared, you know, maybe you can, you know, have an explanation to say, this is why I'm going to London. I've got a couple of things to do and I'm doing some, um, some tourist visits as well. So understand those kind of things. And there is this myth that people say, ah, if you have traveled before, maybe if you have gone to South Africa before, or maybe you have gone to Rwanda before, or maybe you've, you've, uh, you've, you've opened your passport, as they normally call it, that you've gone somewhere before. Some people say it is an advantage. I cannot say if it's an advantage or not. But there is this understanding that, okay, if you are somebody that regularly goes on holiday, maybe it's time to go to London. But if you've not gone on holiday before, and why have you picked London as the first place? You know, it can give that kind of thinking. So those are the kind of tips I would draw for someone that is not visiting family. You can, uh, you can build up on that. But if you are visiting family, it is very, very important that person that you are visiting to give you as much documents as possible to aid your application, you know. And if it is family, let's say husband, wife, parents, there's, there shouldn't be any problem in giving you all those documents. You know, with myself, as I said before, I put in my council tax, my gas bill, electricity bill, my phone bill, my... Uh, uh, um, payment for my house, if all the documents that I had, I put it there to support them. Details of my earning, my task clearances, uh, company, everything. I put everything there to make sure that there's no stone left unturned. And then your own, you that you are visiting, for the case of my parents, they are no longer working. So what we just showed was their bank statement. And then we said, uh, we, the kids, we give them so, 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 so amount every month, you know, and they could see that money there, you know. 
it was just their bank statement and their house that they leave, the bits of documents that they have for the house, they put that there as well. And that was really just about it because they are elderly. Uh, both of them are above 60. I mean, my mom actually came to celebrate her 60 years birthday here. So they are above 60. They are not working. Minimal documents, just how are they feeding? Where are they living? Who looks after them? And we said, we the children, we are the ones that look after them. And we put, I've already put my own documents in and there was no problem. But if you are somebody that is working and you are visiting family, you must be able to show everything that shows what you are earning, where it is coming from, how regularly it gets paid. Do you have savings? Do you have assets, land, properties, stocks, bonds, everything, put it there so that it builds the entry clearance officer's confidence that you are a well-to-do person. You don't have any reason to abandon all these things and just go and start afresh in the UK. That's, that's what we are trying to drive at here. If you are a student as well, let's say you are a student and you are visiting someone, your academic records, letter from the school, letter from lecturer, uh, school fees, uh, payment records, all of that, you want to make sure you put all of that in the application as well. So that the entry clearance officer can have the understanding that you are indeed a genuine student going to the UK on holiday and you'll be coming back after your after you're staying in the UK. Those are the kind of things that you want to put in, in there. I have a cousin that is here as well. He's a student and he's here on holiday. And in a few weeks, he'll be going back. And when you ask him what documents did he put, his uh, school fees, um, records of his uh, academics, all of that was everything he put in the application. And he was given the visa. He's been here for a while now, just having a good time, enjoying himself. Family ties. How do you show family ties? If you are married, put your wedding certificate in. If you've got kids, put birth certificate of your kids in. Put pictures, put receipts of you paying the school fees, uh, the things you do together as family, uh, holidays that you've done together. Put everything in that makes your case very, very strong. And you can. it's also important to show funds of how your family are going to support themselves while you are away. I explained that earlier before. So all those documents, let's start working to them and get them ready. When we are looking at the, um, the refusal letters, it will bring up a couple of points that we'll explain further as well. So once all these documents are ready, you upload them as we said before, and they will be performed part of your, part of your application. Um, immigration rules. The UK has a set of immigration rules. I want you to spend some time to read and digest it. This immigration rules is where the entry clearance officer makes their decision from. You will see in those refusal letters, they will talk about the immigration rules, the immigration rules, the visitor's immigration rules is where the entry clearance officer makes their decision from. I've put the link there so that you can find time to digest it and read through it and be like, okay, I am confident that I have covered everything that is meant to be covered. There is a part of the immigration rules, which is part nine, that talks about grounds of refusal. And there are some more points on the website. I put the link there as well for us to be able to check. So if you've had the travel ban before, and the travel ban is actually for people that maybe they lied on their application, the entry clearance officer does not want to have that impression that you have lied. Maybe you try and hide, uh, you see that place, false representation. Maybe you are trying to hide your previous visa refusals. Don't do that. Put it there, you know, because they already know through um, alliances. There's an alliance called Five Eyes. Five Eyes Alliance, uh, like Canada, UK, US, they are part of that alliance. They share information, including immigration information with each other. So you've done an application before, you've done your fingerprint, US has your application. If you apply to the UK and say they've not denied you in the US before, they will definitely see it. And that ultimately will just throw them off and say, this guy, what else is this person hiding? If they can hide that, you know, that's, they say you don't get a second chance to make first impression. So when you make that impression, they're like, no, this guy or this person must definitely be hiding something else. So. Criminality grounds, if you've committed uh, crime, those are the kind of things that they can use, you know, grounds of refusal. 
previous breach of immigration laws. When you come to the UK, maybe they give you visa and then you overstayed and then you are now applying again and they can see that you have overstayed. Those are other grounds that they could use to refuse you visa. That link that I have there has a lot of um, those grounds there. You can read and catch up on it. And that immigration rules gives you virtually everything the consular officer is thinking about when they are looking at your application. Okay, let's review these refusal letters. And then it will give you an understanding of what the immigration officer is thinking and how they make their decision. You can see, as I said before, you can see paragraph 4.3C of the immigration rules. They will always talk about those immigration rules. So he said, you can see uh, appendix four, Appendix five of the immigration rules for visitor. That was the link that I shared earlier. You will see everything there in terms of how the consular officer thinks. Say so now, I have refused the application for a visit visa because I am not satisfied you meet the requirements. You've applied to the UK for three weeks to visit your son. I understand the importance of family visit, blah, blah, blah. He said, you have indicated that your sponsor will pay 1,500 pounds towards the cost of your trip. You provided a bank statement of your sponsor, which is that person that is meant to sponsor the trip abroad. This is like um, a, a son to a mother now, okay? Or to a father. So it says, but the account balance of the son is 1,314 pounds. So you can see in this case now, you said your son is going to sponsor the application. And the application is 1,000. The cost of your visit is 1,500 pounds. But the account balance of your son is 1,300 pounds. So definitely, that doesn't show that there is enough money set aside for this visit. So what I'm saying to you now, if you are planning to invite your parents, you can see that from that angle, it is always good to have that money it does say that it will guarantee the visa, but imagine if that trip is 1,500 pounds, and then your account is going, your account is going, and you've accumulated, say, 2,200 pounds, somewhere in your savings account, your UK savings account, and your account is still going, it's still running. Let's say that money has been there since January, and your account is still running, still running, still running up until March, and then you now apply for the visa and say, look, you put it in your invitation letter to say, I've saved up this money over time and I'm trying to apply for my mom to come and visit me. You see that that makes a lot of sense. So it now said, um, the closing balance is 1,300 pounds, which is way less than the holiday will cost. I can acknowledge that you also submitted the business account of your sponsor. That means the sponsor has a business in this case. He said, he said this statement, represent the funds used for running your sponsor's business. And you have not demonstrated that these funds are available to support anything else. So whatever money you are putting away, if you are the one sponsoring the whole trip, that money should be in your own personal account, not in a business account. You can have 1 million pounds in your business, but technically your business account is for business because by law, a person, and their business, they are two different entities. That is why it is called a limited liability company. You can see that understanding there. So even though there's enough money in the sponsor's uh, business account, that doesn't concern the entry clearance officer. What concerns the entry clearance officer is the amount of money that is in the sponsor's account for this trip, because the application form showed that the sponsor is taking care of all the costs. So you have not demonstrated that your sponsor has additional funds available to them to cover the cost of this trip. I am therefore not satisfied that your sponsor can and will be able to support and will be able, I'm not satisfied your sponsor can and will provide you with support for the intended duration of your stay. Your application is therefore refused under V 4.3C of the immigration rules that we were talking about earlier. So there's a lot of things that we can learn just from this refusal letter. Now we have another one. Okay, I have refused 
your application for a visit visa because I'm not satisfied that you meet the requirements of paragraph 4.2, again, of the immigration rules. Let's see what they say. So you stated in the application that you are single and are employed as a sales executive and you are earning 1.4 million naira per month. This, this, this is a while, I think this is a long time ago. 1.4 million naira is not 4,000 pounds now. It's about 1,000 plus. This is a long time ago. He said, as evidence of this, you are provided a reference letter. You see, as evidence of your funds and income, you submitted bank statements of Diamond Bank account in your name, closing at this amount. Yes. However, I note that there is nine irregular payments of 3,000 pounds. You can see it, the person lodged so much money within 11th of May and 20th of May. You see what I'm saying now? They put so much money into that account. They don't like to see that kind of thing, that you just put money into your account, bim, 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 suddenly. They'll be thinking, no, this is not a regular amount of money. Maybe that person is putting that money in just because they want to go and visit the UK. You see where the thinking is coming from. So these are the kind of things we want to avoid when we are making an application. Any funds that is coming to the account must be traced back to your employment or a gift that must be specified where that gift is coming from. Let me give you an example. If you are applying for a mortgage in this country and there is a sudden lump sum of money into your account, the bank is going to check on it. Be like, no, where is that money coming from? Because they want to know that the money that is coming, that you are using to apply for the mortgage, is money that you have saved from your employment. If it is a gift from your parents, your gift, your parents have to write a letter to say they are the one that have gifted you this money. That is how they think. So you can see that here, they were able to spot nine irregular deposits into the account within a very short of period of time. And see what they say, the deposits are inconsistent with the account history and your stated income. You have not provided any evidence as to the origin of these deposits, where it has come from, is it a gift? What is it for? You know, I'm therefore not satisfied that these funds are genuinely available for your use or that your financial circumstances or that your financial circumstances are, are stated. So you see where you have to convince the officer that you are genuine and you are actually visiting the UK. No lump sum of money. You can see that example there. Furthermore, I'm not satisfied that you have sufficient funds to cover your costs, blah, blah, blah. And that's another one. Okay, this is another refusal letter. In order to be able to make a decision on whether to grant you a visa, I have taken into account your status circumstances in Nigeria. The reason for your visit and your proposed travel arrangement. You declared that you are unemployed, supported by your spouse and other members of the family. You stated that your sponsor will meet all the costs. This is another son or daughter to parent situation. You stated that your sponsor will meet all your costs associated with your trip. However, you have however, you have provided no documentary evidence of your own personal circumstances and no adequate evidence of any personal income assets or savings. So even if your sponsor will meet all the costs associated to the trip, you still have to show what evidence, how, what you are doing yourself. Let's say, you know, in my case earlier with my parents, we said, we showed them that we are actually the one providing for them on a good day, you know? So they are now saying, however, you have not shown any documentary evidence of your own personal and financial circumstances and no adequate evidence of any personal income, assets, or savings. Said so furthermore, you have not provided adequate evidence of the circumstances, asset, and income of those upon whom you are financially dependent. So if your parents are dependent on you, then you have to show your own financial situation so that they know that this is where the money that your parents are using to fund their life is coming from. You can see the thinking there. 
okay, I must take into account your personal economic circumstances in Nigeria when coming to my decision. However, given the statement you made and the documentary evidence you have presented in support of your application, I am not satisfied that your circumstances in Nigeria coupled with your reasons for wishing to travel to the UK are such that you have sufficient intention to leave the UK at the end of your proposed visit. And you can see when he denied it, he quoted again the immigration rules. So these are the kind of things, you know, uh, I think he continued there. In order to be able to make a decision, yeah, that was just about it. And he quoted the, uh, the immigration rules towards the end. So you can see from these examples how the consular officers are thinking, the way they organize their thoughts, because everything that you put in there, you must, you are just going clean to them and say, look, this is me, this is my financial standing, this is my, uh, my circumstances, this is the person I'm going to visit, and these are the documents related to that person as well. And I think that is the last slide. So I hope this presentation has been able to help you to understand how to apply, I mean, for this, uh, for this visit visa. And let's take a couple of questions. And hopefully when we are answering those questions as well, we are going to be able to learn from each other and then know what steps we need to take. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Toy, for such detailed explanation. I'm sure that everybody has been able to, you know, understand how the process works as well. So I'll just take questions. But before I take questions, please, if you have any questions, now is the time to put them in the Q&A chat box, not the regular chats, the Q&A chat so that we can ask them. Um, so Okpai says, Hi, hi. My husband and I are here on study visa and dependent visa, respectively. However, I had my baby in March and my mother-in-law wants to visit. I've not worked at all, but my husband has. We want to apply for my mother-in-law to visit in January. How do we go about it? Oh, I'm sure she must have been able to see the process as well. What docs do we need to put together? P.S. She's retired and my husband is the only child. His salary is less than 2K pounds. Do you want to answer yes. that? Yes, yes. I just want to touch on that quickly. Thank you so much, Okwe. Um, if his salary is less than 2K pounds, what we need to look at, you said um, mom is, um, the, your mother-in-law is, is retired. Is your father-in-law um, looking after her in terms of funds? Is the father-in-law retired as well? As you've seen in the presentation, how is she faring presently? Who is giving her money to cover her present uh, lifestyle, her feeding, her accommodation and everything? So that is one of the things that we will have to show. And also if your husband, it is not about how much your husband is earning in this case. Now, if your husband is earning less than 2000 pounds, who is going to fund that trip and how much is it going to cost? So you have to show a process where probably out of the money your husband is earning, you've been setting a particular amount aside to cover your mother-in-law's trip or your mother-in-law has some savings to cover the trip. You can see in one of those refusal letters, it's a typical kind of this case, it's a mother case as well. And the mother is planning to come. So you can see the questions that was asked in the refusal. You've not showed me how much the mother-in-law is earning, how she's looking after her expenses. You've not showed me the person that she's going to visit, how much that person is earning, who is looking after the expenses. Let's say, for example, you live in a two-bed flat. You can easily say that your, your mother-in-law is going to come and stay with you as well. That cuts out the cost of um, uh, where she's going to stay. But her flight costs, you know, who is going to look after that? Does she have any other dependent back home? You said your husband is the only child. So definitely she doesn't have any other dependent. But you have to show what she's living on presently, who is funding that, and who is going to um, fund the trip and every document to back that up. Thank you. Thank you so much Shai, for that detailed answer. Okay, I hope you've been able to find an answer to your question. Um, Gifts, yes, the recording will be shared. It will be on our YouTube um, channel as well as we're going to send it to you via email also. And um, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you are still here. 
Um, this is an anonymous person who says, I want to invite my mom for a medical treatment. How is the process? Do I need to use a private hospital or the NHS? What type, what visa type should I use? Okay. So, um, thank you, Gospo. If your mom is coming for a medical treatment, definitely it will be a private hospital because she won't be allowed to use the NHS as she's not living here and paying tax here. She cannot use the NHS. It will be a private hospital. And if you see the link of that visit visa, you see a section there where you can visit for medicals. That is the link that you will have to follow and fulfill all the requirements that have been requested. That is not a standard visitor's visa. That is a visitor's visa that has a medical, um, a medical meaning to it. So that means you will be using a private hospital, definitely, and you'll be using, on that uh, visitor's visa link that you have there, you see a section where it says, if you want to visit for medical reasons, and that's the details that you will have to follow in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Toyib. I'll just go to the next question. Does that mean you can only get six months maximum on your first visa granted? Um, I wouldn't say definitely, but most of the ones that I've seen, it has been six months first, then you apply for two years. I am not sure if you can apply for two years straight away. I can't give you that uh, confirmation here. But I can check through and get back. But most that I've seen, you apply for six months, and then you renew and get two years. And then after that two-year lapse, you get five years. Then after the five-year lapse, you get 10 years. That is the trajectory I have seen in every one that I've seen so far. Thank you um for answering that as well um someone says is english language required for visitors no not at all not at all i mean my parents um were here they didn't have to do any english test and not at all english language is not required not at all okay could you please list top reasons for family visits um i think i mentioned it earlier uh it could be graduation, it could be you have a child, it could be you just want to spend time together. You know, it's 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 human right, you know. There's no there's nothing that says you can't you can't spend time together as a family, you know. You people miss each other, and then you if the money is available, you know, if my child is studying in Canada, if the money is available, I can go and look at her eh, every weekend, you know, that kind of thing. So there is no there is no reason that is too small. As long as you have the funding and the reason is genuine, you know, you can always. And then read through those, um, the, the immigration rules that I said earlier. You will see so many things there and understand how, how they think on the, on the immigration side of things. But graduation, childbirth, so many reasons. Just to spend time is enough reasons to do it. You know, when the Europeans do it with themselves, they don't even think about it. They say, oh, my friend is studying in Barcelona and I went there for the weekend and we just have a good time. You know, those, those, we have those rights as well. So you can, you can always, you know, visit your family for, for those kind of reasons. I hope that clears the question. Thank you. Thank you. Please drop your chats, your questions in the Q&A box so that it'll be easy for me to locate them. Um, okay, so the next person is, Prince says, Mr. Adelodun, will with the hotel reservation, should it be one that you have actually paid for? Or it could strictly be just a reservation. I think it is best for you to have paid for it. It is best. If you have not, I mean, there was uh, there was one. I, I I didn't know I didn't know if he made the slide. He didn't make the slide. I don't know why. There was this visa refusal letter. I shared it online earlier. That person actually paid for the reservation at a hotel. And then when he applied for the visa, three days after applying for the visa, he went to cancel the reservation. And then the consular officer said, I called the hotel and they said the reservation has been canceled. You have not told us anything about anywhere else you are going to stay. So therefore I am not convinced. You see what I mean? So. Don't do just a simple hotel reservation. Pay for it in full when you are applying. And like I said, if you are not visiting family and you are just applying to visit just for visit's sake, you don't just do hotel alone. 
you do all the other places. Because if you travel to a place and you genuinely go into that place, I'm sure a couple of people follow me online when I when I go on holidays and I take pictures. You go to places that are actually of interest in that area. When I went to Albania, I went to south of Albania, I went to north of Albania, I went to places where they are pro processing uh, olive oil. I went to so many beautiful places. And it's a genuine holiday. So that is what you should be doing if you're actually going on holiday. The places that are in the area, if you're in London, you want to see Tower of London, you want to see Tower Bridge, you want to see Madame Tussauds, you want to see Westminster, you want to go and see a football game. Those are the kind of things that they will expect you, including your hotel fully booked as well. Thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, Odam says, my fiance is currently in the UK studying MSc mental health nursing at Teesside University. She was part of the January intake for this year and her program is for two years. She's to come back at the ending of November or second week of December for our marriage. The plan is for me to join her afterwards as a dependent. My question is, how long can I wait after we get married to file to join her? And what are the implications of the new policy of no dependence from January next year? That means that, um, thank you so much, Adam, and congratulations in advance on your marriage. I wish you a very, very successful um, event. I'm just, as I'm talking, I'm thinking second week in January, second week in December for your marriage. I think, I don't know when the embassy closes for Christmas, but you can file immediately. Um, file to come in as a dependent immediately because from January, you will not be able to do it based on the present rules that we have. So as soon as you are finishing the marriage and you've got your certificate, just put in the application. That's what I would say. Put in the application before January. That is the best thing to do if you want to come in as, um, as your fiancé's dependent. But if you leave it after January, it will be difficult. I mean, your fiancé is doing mental health nursing. I'm sure um, she will get a job in that industry because that industry is busy. But you will have to wait for her to be a skilled worker before you can come as a dependent. But if you want to come as a dependent now, I would say that December, there is no clear time in the period that you have to wait. You've been in a relationship for a while. You've got pictures. You've got evidences of everything that you've been in a relationship for a while. You just um, legalized the marriage, you know. So put it in in December before January, please. And also, you don't have to be married, legally married. To, to be a dependent of a student. You just have to be able to prove that the relationship has existed. Maybe you've lived together, you have bills in the same place, you know, you have to be able to prove that. But if you've not, if you are not able to prove that, then it's good to do the marriage to seal everything. So there's no time frame. Please put it in December. If possible, if you can do fast track, do fast track. I don't want you to be near January at all, if you actually want to come as a dependent. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say a few things as well, because I also came in as a dependent. I think that for most people, the most important thing that they, they don't realize is that you need to prove your relationship. So just getting married mm -hmm. is not enough. A lot of people got married, submitted their marriage certificate, but it wasn't approved as well, because they couldn't mm -hmm. prove that it was a real marriage. Real because we have so yes. many issues with um, people faking relationships, faking marriage. Mm. So as much as you want to get married, also compile a timeline of your relationship. Something that's Definitely. the fact that it is real. Pictures, chats, letters, anything you guys have done together that is documented, you can just use that to apply as well. Um, I wish you the best with your application and I hope you can apply before the deadline as well. Um, I'll move on to Emmanuel's question. Emmanuel says, can a skilled worker visa holder visit these countries like Gibraltar, you mentioned earlier, just on their own, even without inviting anyone? Say I, as a skilled worker, want to go to Gibraltar in December to relax and be taken care of. 
I added that. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Gospel, for what you added to the earlier question. Fantastic. You, you've you nailed it perfectly. It is that proof, as we were talking about earlier, you have to prove everything to show them that, look, this is genuine. There's nothing else in it. So put as many proofs as possible in your application. Um, Mr. Amodu Emmanuel, you have worked hard, you know. You can go to Gibraltar to relax. There is nothing holding you. So if you've got a resident permit, a skilled worker visa, you can go to all these countries that I mentioned earlier. Gibraltar, Albania, uh, Serbia, and what was the other one? Montenegro. Just buy, go on booking.com, book a nice hotel beside the sea for a couple of days and buy your tickets and go. You can buy a, a small travel insurance as well, as I said before. That's all you need. You don't need any visa. Your BRP, you just go there, they check it, and they let you in. Once they see that you bought a flight ticket to and fro, and you are leaving their country, no problem. So you can go to Gibraltar to relax. It's about 20, 22 degrees in December. Just have a good time. Gibraltar is a very small place. You do it in like two, three days if you just go around the whole place. But it's it's very, very beautiful, and you have a good time. So Gibraltar, Albania, Serbia, Montenegro, you don't need anything else as a skilled worker visa. Just go there with your BRP, buy a return ticket, book a hotel, and have small travel insurance. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. So we have another person, anonymous person saying, can you invite a relative even if your student visa expires in three months time? Okay, um, putting a time frame to it might be a little bit difficult. Okay, let's say for example, you are graduating. Normally, your graduation is always close to the time your visa almost expires, technically for most students. And most students are still able to invite people for their graduation and the parents come and all of that. So I don't think there is a definite time frame to eat like that. As long as there is genuine reasons, I don't see a problem. Um, I can't say authoritatively, but that's why I use that graduation example. Because for most people, by the time they graduate, their visa is almost expired and they are still able to invite their family. So I shouldn't see any problem with what you are talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, we have another question that says, okay, I think Odam is also continuing his question. He says, and she was sponsored by her dad, so she didn't put anything about me in her application. Would this have any implications? That, that, that doesn't matter. I mean, if she's sponsored by her dad, her dad is looking after her education, that doesn't mean she shouldn't get married. So... <laughs> So as long as your relationship is genuine, that's that's what is important here. It doesn't matter who is funding our education. You know, normally it will be ourselves that is funding our education or our parents. You are the partner. You are not. Uh, you are not. You are not. I mean, technically, not all spans, Not all partners sponsor their spouses' education. So what is important is for your relationship to be genuine, and that's what the the immigration will look after. And as Gospel said earlier everything that you had for your relationship so far, even before the marriage, put everything in. And hopefully there should be no problems. Thank you. Um, I <clears> hope <throat> that has been able to clear up any doubts that Odam has. Um, another person says, I dear different visa issue ratio. Visa issue ratio for friends, parents, and siblings. I don't quite understand what the uh, maybe they are. They are trying to check if there's different visas. For, no, it, it will oh, just be okay. a standard visitor's visa. There is oh, no right. different visa for maybe family, friends. It's just a standard visitor's visa. All right. Edia says, regarding documents to upload, what happens when you don't pay rent, have no tenancy agreements, cancel tax or utility bills, in bracket, gas, electric, etc.? That is a difficult one. Because um, they will want to see where you are living, if to say that person is coming to stay with you. So where would you say they will stay if they are actually coming to visit you and you are not paying rent? Those documents, there is a lot of meaning attached to those documents, apart from putting those documents down in itself. So if you have no document to show that you are paying rent, so where are you staying? Are you in a financial position to actually invite someone. That's what the 
ECO will be looking at. So it will be good to have to have settled down and have those documents before planning to invite someone. Thank you. Thank you, Toy, for that answer. Another person says, if a person receives public funds, such as benefits, can he or she invite family for childbirth? The problem here is that as long as that person coming is the one funding every part of their trip, and you that you are on benefits, hmm, it's a bit tricky because if you are on benefit, what kind of benefits are you on? If it is child benefits, child benefits are universal. Almost everybody gets child benefits. But if you are getting like a housing benefits, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Because if the person that you are saying is coming to stay with you is going to stay in that house, that means that person is technically benefiting from council housing. You know, that's where it gets really, really tricky. So it depends on what kind of benefits you are getting. And if you are basically unemployed and you are getting unemployed benefits and you say you are inviting someone, it becomes complicated. But if that person is coming to stay with you because you just have a child, then you have to say that person is probably not staying in your house, but that person is coming to support you during that period so that it doesn't look like they are benefiting from from the government because by conditions of their visa, they are not supposed to benefit from whatever the government is providing you. So you can see all the arguments you have to make to be able to prove to the, uh, the entry clearance officer that that person coming is not going to benefit for public funds and they are going to fund all their trip themselves. So whatever they are spending, flight, accommodation, everything, they have to be able to show that in their own account. And they have to be also be able to show why they are the only one available to support you during this period. It is that benefit and public funds thing that makes it a little bit complicated. And hopefully if you are able to put documents together and show the clearance officer that there is no benefit to this person um, from public funds and they are able to do everything themselves, that should be okay. But it shouldn't be that you are getting unemployment benefit, housing benefit, you are getting every other benefit available then it's difficult for the entry clearance officer to say that you are you are economically stable enough to invite someone. Thank you. Thank you for that. So YV says, I would like to invite my mom to the UK. She was refused earlier this year. She's retired and doesn't have a business or source of income except for her kids. Please, what kind of documents would we have to present to support her application? I earn 50K annually and in, and including my employment details and bank statements and included my employment details and bank statements in the initial application. Okay, thank you so much for your question. I think your situation is just about like my mom's situation. And what I'll tell you now is not a holy grail, but this is what we did. We put the money that we, okay, let's say in our application, we said the whole trip is going to cost 2,000 pounds. There was 2,000 pounds sitting in my personal account. That was the what we put there to say, all the expenses associated with our trip will cost 2,000 pounds. And this is 2,000 pounds in the account that I have saved over a long time. And that is what I want to use for our application. If you can do that, that will brighten the chances because she's an elderly woman. She's not coming here to work. And they put our own bank statement too as well to show that you are giving her money periodically to show that that is how you are supporting her. Where does she live? Does she live in, um, um, does your parents have a house? How, what documents do you have of the house? Who is paying for the rent? So just analyze those, those bills for her, write it down, prove against it to say, this is how we are covering all these bills for her, okay? And then get the money ready that you put in the application form to say, this is how much that she's going to spend on this trip. Have that money ready in your account and hopefully that will brighten, brighten, brighten our chances. Thank you. I wish, I wish she can come and spend time with you soon. Thank you. 
Thank you as well. Um, so we have for the tourist visa, is it advisable to just reserve a hotel? I think that has been answered. Yes, um, we've answered that. Um is coming over to take care of a newborn grandchild enough grounds for for a visit visa? Definitely, yes. Okay. As long um, as we can prove all the finances. Okay. Hi, I'm on a student visa. Sorry, I'll be rushing the questions because we don't have much time left. Hi, I'm on a student visa and I'm graduating in December. What do I need to do to ensure my mom is able to visit me? I think that has been answered. What do I need yes. to do? That has we, been answered. We've answered that. We've touched that yeah. as well. Um, yeah. If Benga says, if I as a sponsor is working and my wife applicant is working, who has the bigger burden of financial proof of ability, of ability to finance the visits? As you are filling the form, you will be saying you will be saying yourself, who who is sponsoring what? You know, if you say you are the one covering covering the flight, then you have to show in your account that there is money available for the flight. If you say it's your wife that is covering the flight and you are only covering accommodation, it's just whatever wherever you allocate the cost to, because there is a cost to this travel. There's a flight cost. There's a cost of um, who are who else are the dependents on your of your wife back home, you know, who is going to look after her dependents while she is away, all those kind of things. So once you allocate the cost and you tell the entry clearance officer. Who is looking after that cost? Then the entry clearance officer is going to go and look at the bank statement of the person that you have said is looking after the cost and try and find how that person can fund the cost you've allocated to them. So it doesn't matter where you put the cost. But the only thing that I'm looking at here is that the person in the UK, it's easier for the person in the UK to say that um, they are the one looking after the cost because with the UK, it's very, very direct. They don't have any doubt in terms of where the money is coming from. They can see your earnings. They can see the money going aside every month that you are putting away, and they can see the total after a few months. In Nigeria, it's slightly different. You've got exchange rate. We are not sure the exchange rate the consular is going to use, number one. You've got our unstable economic situation. You don't know what the rate will be when they are looking at the application. So those kind of things can create issues. So that's why I say, when somebody is doing it from here, let that person put the money there for the whole trip in their own savings account that is traceable from their earnings that this money is actually accumulated from your earnings. It's not a lump sum like we saw in that refusal before. Then that makes it easy. So it depends on where you allocate the cost and who is looking after that cost. Thank you. Thank you. Um, someone says, I'm a British citizen and I want my boyfriend to visit. Is it better, better off using a tourist visa or can I invite him over as well? Well, a tourist visa and the um, you if you do a tourist visa and you invite him to visit, you get the same kind of they will get the same kind of uh, standard uh, visitor visa. But here is the catch: if you invite him, then you have to provide all your own documents. You know, your your British passport, your accommodation, your rent. Um, your bills, you have to put all of that. Your earnings, you have to put all of that to show that you are genuinely inviting him. But the big catch as well is that if he applies for a tourist, there's a part there where he has to feel if he knows someone in the UK. If he says he doesn't know you, if he doesn't declare that he knows someone, they will treat him like he doesn't know anybody. They will treat his application like he's just coming to visit the UK, just to look around. What you don't want to do here is to try and say he doesn't know you, you know, and then he applies as a tourist and then they think, okay, and then further on down the line, and then you now say you have a relationship. You don't want the entry clearance officer to have any doubts. So I would say, rather than him doing a tourist visa, apply that he's coming to visit you because there is no way he will come here as a tourist and he will not visit you anyway. So it's good to be clear about what you are trying to do and then if he's just coming to visit and you're just going to have a good time, spend time together, I think let's just be clear. But if you are going to do that, you have to put all the documents to show that you are able to um, accept a visitor. So your rent, bills, everything, council tax, whatever you are doing, work, 
give those documents, upload it, and then that will be part of his application. And then he'll also have to show what he's doing back home in terms of work, employment, his own views as well back home. He'll have to put that in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Colin says, good day. My cousin wants to invite me for his graduation in November, and I am married but separated from my husband since last year. The catch is I don't have an active job, but I own a small business that is sustaining me, and my cousin is the one sponsoring feeding and accommodation. But he is asking that I get someone else to sponsor my trip so that I don't raise eyebrows in the sense that what's so special about me that he wants to sponsor everything about my trip. Right. I, I can see where the concern of your of your cousin is coming from. And um, your cousin can always come to visit, you know, your... I think some of us saw um, Tony Elubelu's daughter's graduation recently from London School of Economics. Almost every family member came. The wife came, the kids came, everything came, everybody came, you know. There's nothing bad about it if the funds are available. There's no reason why they would deny you if the funds are available. But with yourself now, you said you have a small business. What are the earnings from that business? How has that earnings been sustaining you? Those are the kind of things the entry clearance officer will look at. You know, where is the money coming from? Why is your cousin going to take all the bills? And that's where the argument comes in. So if you are going to, is being, as I said before, is being able to say, this is where the cost is coming from. And this is the person that is going to look after it. You and your cousin can have a good bond from childhood. You can be the closest cousins ever. You know, you may have made a sacrifice for your cousin and your cousin is thinking, wow, let me just invite my my uh, my other cousin to come and see because we are so close, we are like twins. Some cousins are closer than blood brothers or blood sisters. That can be a good reason. But the burden of proof here is that do you have enough things going for you in Nigeria that will not make you stay back in the UK? That's what the entry clearance officer will be looking at. And that is where you have to show that you have ties in Nigeria that will make you come back to Nigeria after the visit. That is what we need to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Toy. Um, someone says that, what can I use as a proof of family ties to Nigeria for my retired mom? She was recently denied after providing our bank statements, address and proof of employment. Okay. <laughs> I thought I heard she's retired. Yes. Yeah, so if she's retired, how is she able to provide a proof of earnings? Because she shouldn't be earning unless she's getting a pension. You know, that's, that's where we need to look at it. And what I said earlier uh, for one of our brothers there, that, that is the same thing I'll say is that whatever amount of money we have said that she's going to spend, we have to show that money has accumulated over time and we've saved it for that trip. For an elderly person, the ties are not strong because the more elderly you are, the more chance, I mean, this is not like rubber stamped in black and white, but this is what I've seen from experience. The more elderly you are, the lesser the burden that you have to prove like a younger person a younger person a younger active person it's easier to say a younger active person is going to stay back and work than an elderly person you, you can see the logic here so the elder the more elderly you are the burden reduces a little bit but you still have to show where that money is coming from and that is what needs to be clear in the application thank you Thank you. I just wanted to add something. I think that some people, it probably is a rumor that you need to have like, your parent needs to have like a land or a house in Nigeria, even if they are retired, to mm. show that, oh, they have something that they want to come back to. So that is also one reason people usually say that, oh, show strong ties to Nigeria when you're applying for your parents' visa. Like if your parents have a property or anything like that, it is easier for them to get the visa. Or well, I don't know if it's a myth or it's a fact. 
<laughs> Thank you, Gospel. It's, it, 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 the stronger you have those kind of things, the easier it is to prove, to be fair. But that doesn't, I mean, there are, there are 60 year old people in the UK that are still renting. It doesn't mean anything. But you have to be able, you, because once you have built a house, that means you have no, you have no like rent commitment that you have to pay rent every month because your rent also have to come from somewhere. It's always being able to allocate the cost of where you are living now. How are you living now presently? What is your economic situation? So that's why they say, ah, put land, put house, because it shows that you are well to do. It enhances your, your standing. That you can say it's a myth, but at the same time, it makes sense to say, ah, if you have a house, if you have a land, then I'll I'll technically think you are you are doing okay. And you can you can afford this trip. But having said that as well, even this trip that you are planning, you have to show where the money <laughs> where the money is coming from. Thank you so much. I think that will be all questions that we can take today because other questions are like if you go back to you know the recording or if you think back to when we started, you would see that Toyib has answered these questions. Thank you very much for, we had quite a variety of questions from different angles and it gave us a more rounded approach to the topic. And I really love that about today's session. Um, like I said earlier, today's session will be available um, for people who want to watch the recording on YouTube as well. And then we'll also have the slides attached to the YouTube channel and via email. We'll send out an email um, an email blast to everybody who was on the call as well. If your question did get answered, I'm sure if you think back, it has been answered by someone else's question so that we can save time as well. You can also reach Toyib on Twitter and we'll all, yeah, is it... I'm sorry, I'm still getting some questions. We are sorry, we can't take any more questions. But like I said, majority of the questions have been asked. But I think there is one question that is popping up about how long can somebody stay? Can somebody stay for three months on a six months visa? Is it advisable to stay three months on the, on the stretch? There's a myth that if you exceed 150 days or so, is it one yeah. that yeah, that they, they would not be they would not give you a visa next time when you apply. I, I think we just have to be days. reasonable. Yeah. Thanks, Gospel. Thank you so much. I think we just have to be reasonable about it. Because if you say that you are working where you are, you know, when my parents came, they spent, I think they spent up to up to two months before they went back. And they are retired people. So if you say you are working, for example, that my cousin that I say is here, he's actually on holiday and he's meant to go back to school. So he's going to go back to school very soon. He cannot stay beyond that time because when he's going to apply again, they will say, ah, you went and you went past your, your school resumption day. That means you are not actually a diligent student if you're on holiday during school resumption. You see where I'm coming from with this. So there's a specific rule in terms of the number of period. When you go on that visitors, um, that UK visit link, you see how many days you can stay at one go. But that is even subjective, depending on your circumstances. You know, if you are somebody that does business and all that, why would you go to another person's country and go and stay for three months? You see where I'm coming from now. So if you are that business person that you presented to them during your application and you are doing business, you are turning over this huge amount of money, what would you go and do on holiday in another person's country for four months? You know, so even though they might say in that play, in that uh, in the in the official document that this is the set amount of time but when you are filling the form you actually put it there that i'm going to stay for two weeks you're going to stay for one month you know you don't want to go way 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 exceeding that time so they don't think you are actually doing something else let's say you come to help someone for a childbirth for example and you are the grandparent and you are not working it is reasonable to say you spend two three months helping them that's okay but you don't want to overdo it in that sense to make it complicated for you when you are reapplying again. But if you look at that visitor's link and you read through the immigration rules, you see clearly you have an idea of what they expect you to do when you get that visa. Because when you get, um, when you get the two years visa as well, you cannot use two years as a stretch. 
you, you can own, you must leave the UK at least within six months. That is the last thing I saw about it. You must leave, you cannot spend more than um, six months at a stretch, even when you have a 10 year visa, because otherwise it's going to affect your, your applications that you do in future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Toyib. I think that we would have to um, close the webinar right now. Thank you, everybody who has joined in. We appreciate your contributions. Your questions have been very insightful and has given us more opportunities to speak on the topic. Like I said, you can find Toyib on Twitter at TAA -A -A Adelodun on Twitter. He is very active. You can tweet your questions at him. He is very generous enough and he will answer you as well. We're sorry if we couldn't read out your questions. A lot of questions seemed like repetition. So we just try to merge questions as as much as possible. Um, the recording will be available and then we you can also visit um, the slides as well for more details. Thank you all. Um, do have a lovely evening. So we'll meet again for another webinar next month, hopefully, God willing. This was a very interesting one and I hope everybody has a good evening and enjoy your stay in the UK. Enjoy everything that you set out to do and may all our dreams come true as well. Good evening once again. Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gospel. Thank you, Thank everybody. You, it's been a pleasure. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye.